together. We have a chance to welcome everyone who's still with us via Zoom. Welcome back. Welcome to everyone in the room. Um, we are now in the second part of our legislative summit. It's my pleasure to introduce um, the moderator for the second panel, uh, Speaker Joe Kerwinski. And the panel's title is Universal Affordable Child Care Access, Why It Matters and Opportunities for Success. Success. So please join me in welcoming Speaker Kerwinski and our Thank panelists. You. Thank you. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, I am honored and privileged to have the opportunity to, to moderate this conversation around universal child care access and why it matters and opportunities for success. Uh, in 2021, the legislature passed a bill that was signed into law, making it our goal that families pay no more than 10% of their income to cover child care. Uh, we are on the path to trying to figure out how can we make this happen. We know that there are families that are paying over 30% for child care costs, and that's just simply unacceptable. And so uh, I am I'm proud to uh, be part of bringing people together to talk about how we can uh, what's happening out in the field to hear stories um, about why this is important and the impacts it has on families in our community. So it would be great to start by having everyone here introduce themselves and share why they believe a universal affordable child care system is so important to Vermont. So Ali, let's start with you. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so much, Speaker. Um, hi, everyone. What a pleasure to be here. It sometimes feels like a miracle when you're here because I have identical four-year-olds and I thank goodness had a minute to talk to some of their early educators a minute ago who are in the audience and I got my blood pressure down and everyone's okay. Um, I just so appreciate this topic and uh, being discussed today and all, all of you here um, giving your attention. So I'll just explain briefly why I think this is so important through the lens of grounding us in what is Vermont's child care crisis. I think we're all increasingly familiar um, with that. Three out of five kids, even before the pandemic, did not have access to the child care that they need. That's 8,700 children in Vermont today. Today. Think about where they are. What are they doing right now? What are their families doing right now? So that is even before the pandemic, this crisis in access. And then if you think about it, you know, as Speaker Kuinsky just said, if you found that child care, you feel so lucky, but you're paying 30 to 40% of your income to access it. And then when you think about quality, early educators are the heart and soul of a quality early child education system. They're making $14 an hour on average in Vermont without benefits. So there is your crisis, folks. This is a broken part of a business, our broken business model. It is not an infrastructure. And yet, why am I so excited about this work? So rarely in our history, we have an opportunity to pull a lever like this, where when it's not working, it spins us further into crisis, and when it does work, it affects all the things that we care about. So just think about the early development of a child, and every kid having that access. Think about the ramifications for the families, for our communities, for the economy. Here's one number for you, and we can talk about data plenty throughout this panel, um, but here's one number for you, right? $275 million, that's the economic boost we get when we put thousands of Vermonters back to work that we know will go back to work when they have access to high quality affordable child care. So um, there are so many reasons to do this. That's sort of a little bit of why, the what we're trying to solve together. Um, but I just want to round it out with the equity perspective because at the end of the day, that's why Let's Grow Kids is facilitating the statewide movement that has come to the moment that we're in right now, facing a session like this. Um, this movement was founded on the principles of equity, and you can see it, it ripples through every possible dimension of this. First of all, kids. Kids. Kids are not having access to the high quality early learning experiences we know through the brain science that they absolutely need. It is not accessible for those kids. It is not accessible for those families. Through all dimensions, there's not enough of it and it's not affordable. Those who actually get it, there's not enough funding in the system to support the true quality and wraparound services that every single one of those kids needs to support their healthy development and a lifetime of their thriving and success. From academic success to the ability to have successful relationships and anger management and critical thinking and a propensity for or against chronic disease or addictive behaviors. This is happening for these kids between zero and five. This is the basis of an equity issue. 
At the, secondarily, think about the workforce. The wages of the early childhood educators, the bottom 2% of any profession. And these are mostly women. These are mostly women doing the most important job in our world who are making less than anyone else. <laughs> this is an equity issue. The diversity of the workforce is important. The final element here is, you know kids recognize skin tone by eight, six months old. So think about a future when we actually have a prepared and supported workforce, a diverse workforce, who is trained and supported in the work to help their kids and their families at this most crucial time in their development. The equity issue has even crept into our business conversations recently. These large employers, they see this as a crisis, they're able to maybe push a little bit here and there, not solve the systemic problems of, of supply and quality and access, but maybe a childcare scholarship, maybe an on-site program. The smaller employers and their employees can't do that. So a systemic solution to this is within our reach. We've never been closer, the table is set. And think about what's gonna happen when we get this right from all dimensions of the things that we care about. So thank you very much. I really appreciate the chance to talk about this in any possible table. So it's yeah. really a joy to be here with this panel. Great, thank you so much, Allie. Thank you, go ahead. Great, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Nikki Tatro. I'm the director of marketing and e-commerce for a, a small business in South Burlington, Vermont named Instamart. I recently got involved with the Let's Grow Kids campaign on a, a multiple fronts. I am a regional advocate in Lamoille County where I live in Morrisville, Vermont. And I am employer endorser of the campaign and Schmart supports this movement or ready for this action to be taken. And today I'm here to speak to you on behalf of a parent advocate. I am a brand new mom. My daughter turned one year old on October 25th and I survived, yay. So I'm here talking to you about that. I am married and I survived. Um, so this is all great news but for me. But I'm here to talk to you about what I went through, my experience over the last year, because I know it is not unique to me. I know that all of my peers, my friends, my colleagues went through the same thing. So I found out when I was pregnant that I needed to get on the childcare list the next day. I was in the OBGYN parking lot calling and calling and calling, getting on wait lists. My husband didn't know I was pregnant yet, but I know I needed to do that because I know that the lists were insurmountable. And so for me, we ended up getting childcare when my daughter was seven months old. So what did I do for those seven months? I am a full-time working parent. I have teams that need me at work, not just remote, and to be there in person so I can help my business thrive and grow as, as the director of marketing. And I was taking my child to work with me. And I felt so fortunate to be able to do that. My employer supported me, but so many people can't do that. My friends, my colleagues, my peers, they had to choose who's gonna stay home, who's gonna raise my child. And again, I'm here because I'm the lucky one. My daughter now has amazing childcare and has amazing early childhood educators at Next Generation in Williston, and that is 55 minutes from my home. So 55 minutes of my daughter, twice, excuse me, two hours of her day are sitting in the car commuting back and forth to Williston, Vermont because I can't find access anywhere else. Now to the affordability piece. I, my husband and I are very blessed. We live in a, a, a very modest, great life in Vermont and we're excited to be able to do that. My husband is a small business owner. He's a general contractor. We both need to work and we both need to work to be able to afford and live and breathe in the state comfortably and happy. And this is where we wanna raise our daughter. We pay 29% of our household income to childcare, 29% while we're paying off student loans and trying to get good healthy foods to feed ourselves and our daughter and, and pay mortgage and all of the other things that we want to do to support this local economy. It's insurmountable. It's unfair. It's, it's crippling. It's really crippling. So I appreciate this audience today. I, I hope that there are questions as we go through this panel. I'm really here to advocate for all of the parents in Vermont who are going through exactly the same thing who I, that I went through. And really, again, I'm the lucky one. My child does have access. My, both of the, the parents in our household are working. And this is, a, this is a great outcome for us. But there are so, so many people who do not get that. We know that there are 5,000 people in this state who are willing and able and wanting to go back to work. So please, 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 let's collectively make smart decisions together. I know Vermont can do this. I'm excited to support this campaign and thank you for listening. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Very powerful, thank you. Janet. 
Yes. Welcome. Thank you, Joe. Um, and thanks, Allie, and thanks, Nikki. Um, I usually say, like, well, it's always tough to follow Allie, but this time, <laughs> and now I'm following Allie and Nikki, um, who both, right, I mean, really um, expressed, you know, the, a huge, um, I guess, the challenge and the opportunity in front of us right now. So my name is um, Janet McLaughlin, and, you know, I've had the pleasure of learning from and working with early childhood educators um, for the last 10 years. So sort of starting with those who cared and cared for and taught my two boys at Pine Forest um, Children's Center in Burlington, um, and then is serving as the volunteer treasurer at Pine Forest, um, where through many conversations and you know the late nights with spreadsheets, like doing this, right, in addition to your full-time job and your two children, um, you know, I came intimately familiar with the trade-offs between affordability for families and compensation for early childhood educators. Um, you know, and then I was able to join Let's Grow Kids um, and was a senior leader there for several years. Um, and I worked closely with veteran early childhood educators there um, to address capacity and quality and viability, people like Chris, who you'll hear from um, next. Um, but today, I'm primarily here as the executive director of the Vermont Association for the Education of Young Children. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit more about our workforce development efforts through the, throughout the panel. Um, but I want to tell you first a little bit more about Vermont AUIC. So our mission is to advance equity and excellence in early childhood education. Um, with early childhood educators as our foundation, as an organization. But they truly are the foundation for the entire system <laughs> that we have. Um, uh, or that we want to create in the state. Um, you know, we're the state's largest membership association for early childhood educators, and we are the state affiliate of NACI, the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Um, you know, and you know, we work to provide resources um, to early childhood educators and advocate for policies that will you know, move us forward. Um, and I want to point out that our work is aligned with, um, with multiple with, with um, multiple professional resources and standards, right? Early childhood education is not advanced babysitting. It is not like, you know, motherhood 2.0. It is, like, this is a skilled profession, you know, and the work that early childhood educators take on, you know, we have a code of ethical conduct. There's a, you know, NACI, there's position statements on equity, position statements on developmentally appropriate practice. Um, in the state of Vermont, um, you know, there are the Vermont guiding principles um, for full and equitable participation of each and every child. There's a Vermont Early Childhood Action Plan. So I just want to, you know, provide a little bit of that context, right, that this is serious work. It is research-based work. Um, it is skill-based work that early childhood educators are taking on, and we know that they are compensated nowhere near the value that they are bringing to the children, to their families, to our communities, and to our economy. Um, you know, for Vermont EYC, we are really proud to run programs with support from the state of Vermont, you know, uh, you know via the legislature. Um, we ran the Teach Early Childhood Scholarship Program um, for early childhood educators. We run a registered early childhood education apprenticeship program. Uh, we're um, in the early days of a pre-apprenticeship program for high school students. Um, and we run the, the newly established student loan repayment assistance program. And we've also spent several years as the backbone for an initiative led by early childhood educators in the state um, to establish a recognized profession um, for early childhood educators in the state that would provide a clear and consistent basis for quality and for compensation in the field. Um, so I'm happy to go into more detail on all of that as we continue our discussion. Great. Thank you so much. And it's true that this, the, the, the child care uh, policies that we're looking at is so wide-ranging and workforce is such a huge part of that and so I'm looking forward to talking more about different ways that we can support um, the, the workforce side of, of this this challenge that we're trying to, to solve here and fix so to you okay. um, my name is Chris Nelson and I own and operate Mountain View Child Care in Troy Vermont um, I came into this field I fell into it kind of because I had four children under the age of five who needed childcare and the two places I could get them were 45 minutes apart and then I had to drop them off and drive and everybody had different schedules and when to be picked up it was impossible it, it was way too expensive it um, took too much time out of out of our quality time um, because there was no quality time it was all on the road um, and, uh, and it just didn't work. So I looked at it at that point and I said, I know the problem, so now I need to find the solution. So I, I quit my job and I decided to open my business. 
And when I opened my business the first day, I had six two-year-olds sitting out with me, and um, I had a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> like, what, what am I going to do with these little creatures and their minds that I can shape and, and grow? And, and I decided to look at it. I will give every child something new every day. Um, and I will learn better so I can do better. And I went back to school while I was um, doing childcare and I got an education in childcare. I had other degrees previously um, so that I could focus on what it was. And I read all the research. I realized that at age three, by age three, the trajectory of that child is already being determined by the, um, and impacted by the um, quality experiences they're having. So. I can, I can change that and I can emphasize the best growth and the best development that they can have. Um, and so if I invest my, my skills in these children, then they grow up and they have in their heart memories of Vermont that will keep them here. I left the state, I came back, and the reason I came back is because I wanted to raise my children to have memories that I had here. So I came back with my kids, we, we built our business, um, now I have children, I've been in it 30 years, I have children of my first group mm -hmm. in my care now, and they'll still say to me, hey, do you remember when we did this? And I'll put <laughs> it back into the program, because if you can remember a memory in your heart, you know, 20 years later or 30 years later, then that made it, meant it meant an impact. And if you can relive that memory with the child in my care, then we get to, to keep, you know, spinning that cycle. And then the, the parents can go to work and they feel comfortable and they're not worried about it. They can focus on their job and I can focus on the children and they can share that at the end of the day. So my role as an early educator impacts everybody in this room regardless of where you're coming from and we all have an opportunity when we know the problem to meet the solution. And we know the solution now. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, go ahead. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Speaker, for, for having me. I'm very excited, very passionate about this topic. So my name is Adeline George. I'm the president of Vermont Creamery. We make delicious, award-winning uh, cheeses uh, in central Vermont. Um, business has been um, in, in the States operating for 38 years. So um, we have a big responsibility, 130 um, employees and 85% of our workforce is in manufacturing. So um, also to know that I'm a mother of two young boys, Matisse who is 11 and Hugo who is six. Um, and so I'm in the thick of it. I think you picked the right word, it's survival mode. <laughs> uh, um, and so and I'm, I'm running a business. My husband is traveling uh, two weeks out of the month so, uh, and all our families are in France. So no support no backup, um, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's an interesting journey. Um, we know the past three years we have felt the impact of a global pandemic, mm -hmm. juggling work, running businesses, childcare, school, and it really had uh, underscored the necessity of, uh, of what uh, childcare is, which is a necessity mm -hmm. for us. Uh, think of a, a manufacturing worker. If this person cannot show up to work because the childcare is closed or because there is no childcare, we simply cannot run the line. And what I mean by that is the milk is coming and we have nobody to turn this milk into cheese so, um, and to put food on the table and on our supermarket shelves. So the importance of childcare for our employee is critical, is essential. Um, for, for, for our staff. Uh, as our business has been very fortunate to achieve incredible growth over the past uh, couple of years, and when you look at the fortune that we have, um, but also the challenges that we are facing for supporting this growth, it's not lack of market access. People love Vermont cheeses in general. It's not lack of resources or capital. Uh, not lack of uh, access to milk. It's literally the number one challenge is workforce. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> now, um, and when I look at uh, the opportunity that we have here to really change the game, to really bring on the people into Vermont, because there is a supporting infrastructure, but also support the people that wants to work, 
childcare solve all of this. Um, and, um, and so we need to pay attention to that and we need to be forceful about where we want to take this opportunity. Um, we face the challenge that across our entire team we have developed hiring practices. Uh, we offer great benefits. We just launched uh, something called uh, flexible manufacturing mm -hmm. where um, people pick their hours um, whether they want to start at 10 o'clock in the morning because they got to do the drop-off uh, or leave at 2 o'clock in the afternoon because they got to do the pickup to really try to think differently um, into how, how we structure our workforce uh, to adapt to those conditions. Um, but even with all those efforts, we know that we can't solve it as an employer alone. And that's why when Ali called 2020, <laughs> Um, I think by that time I still had the kids upstairs. I was like, oh my God, stop screaming. I'm on conference going in and she's like, hey, you want to talk to child care? I said, yes, please. <laughs> um, because at that time my husband had paused his work so he could watch the kids so I can run a business through a pandemic with the essential workers. Um, we still were paying our daycare because I'm like, I can't have them going out of business so we need to keep paying even if we're not sending our kids. And so when Ali said, you know, I'm putting this group together called the CEO Think Tank and we need to think of how we're gonna put this uh, build together, um, I was like, yes, absolutely, let's do it. So uh, we know, I, I won't repeat, but I wanna repeat, uh, Vermont is a strong uh, childcare system that is affordable, 29%, this is not acceptable. It's not sustainable for our, for our, our state, neither our parents. Uh, for all family uh, that fairly compensate early childhood educator and offer room for all our children. Um, and so we have, um, we have an opportunity. We passed this bill, one, uh, 171, uh, in 2001. And, and so that was a big momentum, that was a big achievement from, from all of us. And um, this is the first step, and we need to keep um, the pressure, we need to keep the momentum to uh, really um, be the first in the nation to, uh, to offer, I call it universal childcare for, for, uh, for all our working family. We can position ourselves as a leader in this space. Um, and also um, recruits, repopulate our state with young uh, working families and, uh, and uh, propel Vermont in a thriving economy as a result of this. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, you know, you spoke about how your business has been impacted by the, the lack of affordable and universal child care system. Nick, you're going to look at you. You spoke so uh, eloquently about your personal experience. And could you tell us what it's been like at your organization as well? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, I'm a director of two teams at Instrumart. And so, um, you know, we have been dealing with the throes of trying to get employees back to work post COVID pandemic and getting everybody in person so we can work collaborative collaboratively together and so like myself they have also been built bringing children to the workforce to work with them so really I think for me and as a director of my team I look at the workforce and think how do I get these people to stay on the team who are proven themselves very valuable and how do I get more my my, my company is very fortunate right now we are growing and I need more team members I need more help and so from a recruitment and retention standpoint this is equally important, if not even more so, so that even though Instramart, with our tremendous flexible policies of, of 16 weeks paid leave for the, the maternal parent, as well as um, uh, bringing your child to work with you, we have come up with creative solutions, as Adeline spoke about too, and so it's still not enough. And so we want to make sure from, a, from an employer perspective, we're doing just as much as we can for each individual. Thank you, thank you. And that's another thing, recruitment and retention, not only for our businesses across the state and nonprofits, but also for staff in childcare centers, mm -hmm. right? And so we know that there are challenges with our early education providers with staffing and access to resources. So I'm gonna go back to you, Janet, just to talk about what you are seeing on the ground. Out yeah. There. So um, last spring, um, Vermont EUIC did a survey of uh, early childhood education programs in 
uh, in the state. And um, we heard from um, a really, you know, for over, from over half of the center-based childcare programs in the state. Um, and of those, 83% of them were reporting that they had staff vacancies. The average number of staff vacancies was th was three, um, right? And each of those, so, and even if you, you know, that translates to, it was translating to, you know, up to, you know, 10 slots in each of those programs, right, that are currently not available because they cannot, because programs cannot find early childhood educators to fill those roles. And programs are being incredibly diligent and creative about working with people who, um, anybody who wants to enter the field to support them in starting on this career path and support them in developing the skills that they would need. Um, uh, you know, to continue to grow in the profession. Um, but right now, it, it, we're in this very tricky place where we're saying this work is important, it's rewarding, like you will, um, uh, you, know, you know, have a smile on your face at different moments of your day that like you cannot get that experience any, you know, through almost any other job. And yet, it's also a job, right, where, you know, the wages are incredibly low um, you're expected to be there in person, you know, having like, you know, a pretty, you know, um, you know, close connect, you know, very close connection, right, with, with young children, and you don't have health, you know, you don't, your employer's not able to offer you health benefits. They're not able to offer you um, disability insurance, right? When if you have, when if you hurt yourself and you need to, you have to get up and down off the floor a gazillion times, right? And so um, they don't have disability insurance for you. Um, so the lack of benefits, um, you know, combined with the low wages is just, it's not sustainable for so many people within the field. The people that are doing it right now are carrying the system and the leaders of these programs are kind of, you know, they're kind of being superheroes and we, that, that's not a, that's not an answer, right? <laughs> um, for us, um, you know, for us as a state, given what we know, how important this is, um, the supports for um, early childhood, I would say early childhood educators are really um, interested in pursuing um, their professional growth and development um, in the field. And so some of the, the um, you know, right now at CCB, early childhood education is their largest like concentration and area of study in terms of the number of students that they have. So people are excited about this. And the reason that that's happening right now, though, is because this, there's supports that are in place, right, through all the investments in higher education and, and resources that, that have been, we've been able to dedicate sort of thanks to COVID, but like thanks to relief dollars. Um, but in terms of the, uh, the scholarship dollars, apprenticeship programs, um, critical occupation scholarships, I think I just wanna say like early childhood educators are excited because they do recognize that when they have um, the expertise um, in, and knowledge that they can see how that allows them to serve the needs of their kids, of the kids that they're seeing more family. And Chris can probably speak really well to the fact that like the needs that our uh, child educators are seeing in programs um, amongst among children are growing and getting a little bit more complex, and the skills that you need to address them are um, are mm -hmm. elevating. Um, but I think ultimately a lot of it comes down to again like a lack of respect and understanding for early childhood educators and for the work that they're doing, um, and that's something that we've been you know together in term, you know with Let's Grow Kids and with so many people you know working to build awareness. And I and I have heard from early childhood educators who say that they. You know, are feeling seen for the first, you know, for the first time in, you know, in their entire careers. Mm -hmm. um, but Chris, I wonder if, what you would add to that. Um, Chris is one of our board members as well from uh, yes. AUIC, so <laughs> we should have probably let her go. No, 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 no. Go, go ahead. Okay. Um, so to to go on what Janet said, I've been in this field for thirty years. Um, my primary um, position and my passion is in my my child care business itself. Um, but, but it's never been sustainable. And in all the years I've worked, I've never worked only that position. I've had to work two or three jobs to bring it in. Um, and what I try to do is work with other people in my field to make sure they know um, what's out there, what they can attach, and how we can piecemeal different things together. That's not a way to build a workforce. It's a way to, to help a workforce. But it's not a way to build it because I can't go in one of my roles to the high school and convince parents to allow their children to follow their dream and go into early education if I can't explain to the parent how they're ever going to pay that back, how they're ever going to make a living, how they're not going to have to work the three jobs that I work. Um, 
and the and on the flip side of that, and, the, and so the benefits that we have during the day, my benefits on my job that I love so much, I can go barefoot. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm outside most of the time. Um, I hear giggles every day. Um, I get the aha moments. I get to see the first in a lot of things that parents miss. So, so those are my benefits, but that doesn't feed my family. It doesn't pay my bills, and it doesn't help me retire. So we need to invest in that so we can build the people up, because our workforce is aging out. And if they can't put into an IRA or help put into Social Security, then we're also going to have to have to take care of them later. So again, we could either be, we know what the problem is, and now is the time to solve the solution. We want people to come, we want them to stay, we want them to, to thrive, and we want them to believe in this state and believe in what they can bring in so that they can give back. Thank you, Chris. I, I will say that, it, you mentioned this, Janet, that it's a really important that our early childhood educators feel seen and are seen and are heard and part of this conversation and our work. And, you know, it's it's always challenging and super important work, but during the pandemic, we were, we were tested, mm -hmm. so tested. And it was, I mean, early childhood educators were superheroes and the glue that kept the families together during an incredibly difficult time and continue to work through that. And so I, I feel like I can speak for the, all the educators, the legislators in the room to thank you for your incredible work. And uh, I just, let's give them a round of applause for their incredible work. So I'm gonna turn back to you, Allie. Uh, Let's Grow Kids has been working hard on organizing this effort and making sure that all Vermonters are heard through this process. Uh, what are the key messages that you and your team have been hearing across the state? I love that question. Okay, <laughs> so you just heard them all. I can just stop <laughs> But uh, let me just start by saying, I don't, I don't know if you all are getting the like, the goosebumps and the shivers and the holding back tears a little bit like I am over here in the corner but it is just really humbling mm -hmm. to be here with you all I mean every single one of you sharing your personal stories talking about what brings you here it just reminds me what an amazing privilege and joy it is for us to be in Vermont together we have identified a problem we are coming together from all different perspectives to solve it that is what we see every single day and it really is an honor of a lifetime to be in this sort of position in this movement um, and let's kids and see this and be a part of it and so we are hearing things like the time is now the time is now and if we do not do this then what it's sort of this like staring to the precipice when everything has come together the table is set you know there's good news here we're hearing the crisis that we're solving but the good news is we have a plan we have a question ahead of us in this legislative session and it's kind of a yes or no question yes the details matter but folks have been working on the details in this building and on the campaign trail and in the field for so long I've never seen an effort where there's been so much thought put into the policy detail best practices from around the world from other states where we've all coalesced around the policy sort of principles uh, and what best practices for transforming child care. At the same time, the implementation on the ground, the infrastructure is ready for this policy so it can be successful implementation. And the third is the people power. The people power coming together to say, yes, we need this, raise our voices, especially from marginalized communities to make sure they have an outsized impact on the detail you know, of the policy and sharing their stories and making sure this is really a true, successful transformation. And, and so the messages we hear along that path the time is now. We can't afford not to do this. Why haven't we done it? We haven't done it because we're talking about money. I think we have to be clear about that. We're talking about money. It will take a public investment to build a public infrastructure. But the messages we hear are from all sorts of folks, small business, big business, uh, parents, grandparents, early educators, healthcare providers. We are paying in the same size and scope of what the cost will be to fund this infrastructure and be the first in the country to have high quality, affordable, accessible, equitable care. You know, we're already paying right now in these heartbreaking and very expensive, you know, expenditures in pretty much every sector. Wor workforce, recruitment, retention, healthcare, you know, workforce crisis uh, workarounds, 
Um, you know, and the heartbreaking work of, of taking care of these kids at every single stage of their life because they did not have access, you know, to the opportunities they need zero to five. So that's what we hear is we can't afford not to do this. We know it's a tough conversation. It has to work for Vermonters and the time is now. Can't afford not to. It pays for itself immediately and over a lifetime. So that's what we're hearing beyond it's the right thing to do and it's the smart thing to do, right? Like when do we get a chance to take care of our kids, go upstream and do that? knowing the data is there, the solution is there, the consensus is there. Oh, and it's a great investment, you know, from everything from the human cost to the dollars and cents. So uh, that's what we're hearing. You're hearing it here today. I mean, this is, these are the stories, you know, when I was thinking, oh, we talk about data, you got all the data you need from Nikki. 29% of income, you know, 55 minute commute, seven months until you found childcare. I mean, there in a nutshell, it's pretty much all the data you need. And, and, and the other thing I would just say is this word survival. That is really not what I think we all want when we talk about the joy of becoming a first time parent or having young children. You know, it should be joy, not survival. And so we have an opportunity as a state to do that. And when you talk to folks, you can feel that, you know. And the, the last thing I'll say is not only is the time now because of the movement and where we've come and the, uni the unity, even the political unity of this, but 117 child care champs just got elected and they're not just smiling and saying, yeah, I like kids. They are sophisticated champions that understand these details, that know every single piece of this has been sort of vetted and researched and worked on by the field, like Janet's great work with the workforce and each piece is historic, but we've gotten them all ready and it's sort of served up, you know, in this moment, starting with H-171 and the work that this building did this great, these great legislators did for that. So the table's set, and now it is on us to sort of bring it home. Thank you, Ali. Strong messages from all across mm -hmm. the state, from all corners. Uh, so there are a lot of ways that people envision um, a child care program that is available to all Vermonters. And so what does success look like? What does that look like to you? And I know that's a very broad question, but it's, it's broad on purpose. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I want to have, uh, Janet, would you start with that? What does success look like? What does a successful <laughs> program look like? Um, I mean, a successful program looks like a, you know, a joyful, inclusive learning community, right, where early childhood educators are truly able to, you know, do what they know supports the healthy development of our youngest children, and they're able to do that with confidence that they, um, uh, you know, are, are being, you know, that they, can, that they can afford to feed their family, right? That they would be able to take time off if they got sick. You know, that they, um, that they can pay for care for their own children, right? So that is, um, I mean, that is a real, you know, uh, you know the, the, at the highest level, in terms of a more specific recommendation from, the early, from early childhood educators in Vermont, is that they would like to create a recognized profession. You know, you can think of it sort of as similar to nursing, right? Where you have sort of a you know an entry level credential, you have a you know a creden you know, um, and then you know you're moving from an LPN to an RN to you know to a nurse practitioner, right? Because we know that we need um, people at all these different levels, and in, and um, there is a framework for this. There on the national level, um, you know, 20 of the largest um, organizations um, dedicated to the well-being of young children have come together created a unifying framework for the early childhood education profession. Here in Vermont, we've spent the last, um, there's a group of early childhood educators in the state who have spent the last four years really diving into that, starting with the question of like, should we even explore this, right? They're not just assuming, right? And then moving through each element of this framework piece by piece to say, what would this look like? What would it mean for Vermont? What excites you about this? What concerns you about this? And um, we, you know, and there is now a, you know, a consensus and a recommendation to, to establish early childhood education as a profession, move to individual professional licensure. Um, the over 2,500 early childhood educators in the state were engaged in this process in a really, in a really deep way, right? Like in terms of providing feedback, not just like you got handed a flyer, but like an actual engagement. Um, and so we're ready, we're feeling um, excited ab about moving towards the next step and looking at what the um, legislation would be for that. Um, you know, and ultimately, it's what will create 
um, the system to allow people to enter the profession and to move up. It allows us to, and it it's, provides a framework for us to hang compensation onto mm -hmm. um, in a way that's meaningful. It allows our higher education institutions to know what their skills they're supposed to be training against. It allows our employers to know what they're supposed to be hiring against uh, or what, what you know potential applicants actually have as their skills. And so I think it, it will really allow us to um, unwind some of the complexity and the sort of top-down approach that we have right now. Um, to overseeing early childhood education and really allow early childhood educators um, to step forward as leaders of their own field. Great. Thank you so much, yeah. Janet. <laughs> How about you, Nikki? What, what does success look like? <laughs> success from my perspective as a parent here today is a lot simpler than that, fortunately. Simpler <laughs> in, in layman's terms, but harder to achieve, right? For me, it's accessibility, number one, first and foremost. There are so much stressors that are going on, and like I mentioned, I'm a first-time parent, and my first thought was, oh no, what am I going to do for my work? We don't want that. We want people to celebrate this moment, this changing moment in their lives. So accessibility is number one. We'd like to support more childhood child care opportunities and resources in Vermont, and hopefully close to Lamoille County would be preferable <laughs> to me. Yeah. So accessibility is number one. And then the second for me is affordability. I, we, my husband and I both love our careers. He loves what he does. I love what I do. I love being a mom. I love all of those things. Now, how can I make all of those things work for me successfully together? And affordability is number one. It's kind of like this circle where, you know, I'm going to my boss and saying, hey, I always need to make more money because I, all the other things are getting more expensive. I just want to enjoy my work. I just want to not fight for every dollar. I don't want my husband and I to have very exhausting, as we all do, conversations of what's the sacrifice this month? What are we going to do? What, are, what, what do we cut out? And so, and now we're getting to this holiday season too, so there's lots of conversations around that in my household as of late, but really affordability. We need to make it affordable for Vermont families to be able to have both working parents in their households go to work and be involved in our workforce to grow our local economies because we want to see the state thrive. Thank you, Nikki. You're welcome. So powerful. How about you, Adam? Um, well, uh you know, Janet and Nikki said said it well. Um, it's it's those three pillars, and it starts with the childhood educator. Uh, uh, we pay them more, them more. We recognize them. We empower them. That's going to bring more people into uh, the industry. That's going to then the ripple effect is going to increase capacity, which is going to tackle the second pillar, which is accessibility. So more people come in. We, we, lift, we lift the experience and the service, we increase capacity, now we have solved this other pillar. The third pillar is affordability. And you know, I mean, we make cheese, we're in the agricultural <laughs> business. And so, um, you know, when I think of our starting wage, and then I think of at that starting wage, you cannot afford 30% of your income going to, um, to childcare. And so, um, you know, that 10% threshold is very, very meaningful. And, um, and so by focusing also on that, using those resources to help to fund this part, then that means more people can come back to the workforce, more women specifically can come back to the workforce, and, and again, solve this, uh, this workforce shortages that we have, not only for today, but I really see this is an investment into the future. Mm -hmm with a very short term payback, which is usually you don't see that very often. It's either we're gonna invest for the three to five year out, and then we gotta be patient. With this proposal, it's, it's literally thousands of people coming back into the workforce, and I, yeah, I'm thinking of the woman that I would love to hire full time, not on a flexible manufacturing part time job, and, uh, and yeah, so it's those affordability, accessibility, mm -hmm. um, that are important. Thank you. Definitely hearing some themes here. How about you, Chris? Um, and I agree with what everyone said. I think that we need to invest in early educators and we need to invest in, in them so they can invest in the children. So the families can invest in the workforce and, the, in the, and, and be present at their job. It, it's, it's just such a cycle. Um, and, it, and it does, it starts with us and, and my fear is that I continue to get calls, which I get all the time, to go on wait lists in my program. And, and I'm honest with the people that call, you got three years at least out. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'd like to be able to say in six months, or I'd like to be able to refer to somebody else. I would like to be able to, to know that there's a place for every single child, regardless of, of the, the amount in their bank account, and regardless of their zip code. The state of Vermont is cared for from top to bottom, from birth all the way through, and that's what we need. We need to, to make strong individuals and strong families, and, and it's tie, it all ties together. So the investment, the investment's there. We don't have time to get this wrong anymore. We, because if we wait another five years or 10 years, the workforce is gonna be gone. And, and it, you aren't gonna make up skilled people with confidence and, and competence in a short amount of period, period of time. We've got to invest now. We've got to get this right. Thank you, Chris. Holly, anything to add on to that? Oof. I know that's a challenge. That's uh, normally you're thinking of your response too, yeah. but I just, I'm hanging on your every word, folks. You nailed it. I would just say, uh, make no small plans, right? My <laughs> success for me would be raising the quality of life for, for Vermonters from every corner of the state, from every, walks, every walk of life. And that sounds big, but if you think about it, how do you do that? You go upstream to the thing that is blocking that from happening. Mm -hmm. And this is that thing. This is one of those things. Everything you just said, the idea of you allow us to move you know, in the right road on this crossroads of Vermont. We either let our demographics crush us, let our costs go out of control, don't allow employers to create opportunity and jobs, don't allow them to hire, don't allow them to grow, don't allow families to thrive, or you find a nugget like this that is so systemic and so upstream that when you open it up, we all take this breath, wages go up, jobs come to Vermont, they expand. The early, whole sector of early child educators, you know, get livable wages and can be, you know, have one job and focus on that job. Think about continuous improvement and focusing on that kids. You know, that's that immediate benefit. We have young people moving to the state. All of our taxes go down. You know what I mean? You create like the virtuous cycle of prosperity and opportunity, and you look at these little nuggets upstream to be able to do that. It sounds huge, but what we've seen in the many years getting this to the point that it is together is that this holds that potential. I think that's why we're standing here today thinking about a massive investment that has so far fell out of our reach. It's not out of our reach anymore because we understand that impact and it's a choice we make about the future of Vermont and whether we're gonna be economically viable and young people can be here like we've all enjoyed um, or come back here. And so um, that's how big it is, right? That's how big it is. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So we've just heard so much incredible thoughts and feedback around this table. I think it would be um, great to now open it up for questions. Um, and I'm looking out there. Let's start with Representative Shaw. Thanks. Thank you all. I'm uh, Representative Robin Shaw from Middlebury. And I really appreciate all the work that you're doing in your comments and how important it is. And you're bringing me back to the time when I had my first children and I have grandchildren and so I've seen a couple generations of dealing with child care so I appreciate the work you do and the challenge that you have to find it in the first place. So you've talked a lot about, um, you know, not just the business of child care and all the challenges there, but also it feels like as we talk, the, the burden's on the parents to figure this out so they can go back to work. When we talk about workforce, and how this is going to benefit the, the workforce and benefit businesses. So what I'd like to hear is what you think the role and the responsibility of businesses are who are the beneficiaries of getting a workforce back as a result of us doing this. So, so what's the role for business in all this? What's their responsibility? Yeah. Do you I want to take that? <laughs> um, it was really good question. I appreciate that because when, um, Addy pulled us together, you know, I, I started to learn how, how government works mm -hmm. like, um, and, you know, how we could get funding and this and that. And I remember at some point we were getting further down the road with, with a conversation. I'm like, we're talking return on investment, we're talking uh, retention, we're talking about operating a capacity of the potential of our businesses. And so I'm like, I asked the same question, who's responsibility that is. And Ali was like stepping back and well, I want to see what, what's the answer among those CEOs. And we agree the people in, in that CEO think that 
we have a responsibility too. I can, you know, I can put a number on the amount of um, opportunity we had to pass down for our business because we don't have the, the workforce. I can, uh, you know, I can track that down. I can also track down that, you know, how much it would cost for us to solve that alone to have an on-site daycare. We're a cheese maker. We don't do what you do. <laughs> and we don't want to do that, but we're like, what are we going to do? Are we going to just put that, that money towards solving it ourselves, which is not the, our job? Or do we leverage a very uh, talented, incredible, uh, well-operated organization that I have a plan, do you want to come in? And so long story short, businesses have an opportunity. I'd love to just uh, follow up with that too and thank you for the question. Most businesses, as you can see, and I'm curious if Nikki has a response too, will say, got it, you know, pretty fast, very, you know, concrete thinkers, this is how I do my bottom line, oh yes, you got me on the ROI, you got me on the necessity, you got me on my own, like, interest in this plus a public interest, how do I fix it? Unfortunately, the only solution to this is public investment, full stop, because you do not create a profession. You do not solve the access for all folks. You don't make an equitable system that is sustainable, that actually can be affordable, high quality and accessible, and you know, really abide by certain standards. Businesses could piecemeal all do their own on-site childcare, and it won't be affordable for families, and it won't be quality, and you won't create a pipeline of early educators and a profession. So there is just no one-off solution, which is why the business community has started to coalesce over the last couple of years. I think, again, another piece of the puzzle of why we're here today. We have to pay in. We know we have a responsibility. We know we have a major outsized benefit. We probably spend more on recruitment and retention and these other efforts than we would if we paid into an efficient, effective system, a systemic equitable fix that can only be routed through a public investment and the government. Right? There, this is a public-private marketplace still. It's a beautiful, elegant example of efficient and effective and targeted and public-private. There are market forces that still come to bear. But you know, the way the business community can continue to participate is to pay in as businesses in some way you know, for a systemic fix. And if they try to go it alone, it will be piecemeal, not quality, and just not sustainable. And just a, one more little moment on it. You know, one of my favorite um, stories and one of the most incredible champions for this is Twincraft uh, Skincare, another manufacturer in Essex, Winooski. And they said, well, that's it. We just have to put something on site. But as Adeline said, we're soap makers, we're not early educators, and we would subsidize this to the tune of sort of all, you know, millions and millions of dollars. It wouldn't be high quality, we wouldn't have the workforce, you know, and it would only be for a small fraction of just our employees. And what about all those other community members that would need that access? So that she's like, sign me up for something else. Let me pay in in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, to me, that, that illustrates. Right, absolutely. How about you, Nikki? I'd have to just echo both of what Adeline and Ali said. Instamart is ready, and we looked at, from an executive leadership standpoint, what do we do? How do we solve this? And I was bringing him, the president of the company, my problems every day with my daughter in my lap, saying, okay, you hold the baby. Let's talk about this. How are we going to fix this? And so we did talk about opening up a child care system around Instamart in Instamart for our employees, but it's not the solve. It's a very small temporary solution, and not to mention it would cost millions of dollars upfront, which is not sustainable, right? So when we got looking at and thinking about more creative solutions, so lucky to be fortunate and introduced to Ali and, and this movement and this campaign and said, wait a second, we also have a solution. This is our solution, this is what we propose. We are so much more happy to support a movement that is causing and representing systemic change rather than sm solving a small business issue just within our four walls. That's not the solution from a business perspective, and we're ready to, to support financially this campaign to be able to cross this finish line. Thank you, Nikki. Janet and Chris, anything to add to that before we move on to the next question? I think all I would add is each time a business creates um, a center on their site to offset the, the um, challenges of their employees, when they open the position up, it takes somebody from somebody experienced mm -hmm. from another place and creates a hole over there. Mm -hmm. so, so what you're doing is, is you're shifting a workforce. You're not creating or building or strengthening a workforce. You're just moving them from one place to another and that doesn't create um, any lasting change or any benefit for the rest of the communities. It just yeah. 
which is it's a right. game of uh, shells. Got it. And, and I would just to, con- to continue the theme, right? This is a resource issue. You know, when you know in the the time that I have been doing this work, right? The conversation was, you know, like, well, what if we just organized it, right? Or right? Couldn't you know, like, well, let's get some businessmen to come in here and look at the numbers and figure it out, and we're going to figure out a way to actually make this sustainable, you know, because maybe these, you know, um, you know, these small business women or you know these nonprofit leaders, they don't know what they're doing, and then they came in and looked at it, and we're like, oh, nope, we can't solve this either, right? We had to like go through several years of a learning process around that, and. Um, and now I think everybody sort of threw it to say, you know, the issue truly is, it is truly is a resource issue. This truly is a public good. Um, and we need to, and we need to make the investment um, because, you know, we've said it a million times, right? Parents can't afford to pay more. Early adult educators can't afford to make less. Um, so we need to figure out where we're getting the resources. Great. Thank you, Janet. All right. I think we have a question on Zoom. Connor, could you? Uh, we have two yeah. questions and I think they're sort of tied in together, it might be best for Ali to start, but um, Jim would like to know, as a person with several organizations who will be positively impacted by universal child care, please provide info for a way businesses and individuals may support and endorse this effort. And then we have the second question, uh, can someone on the panel discuss how long the rollout will be for this type of proposed plan, and how the creation of new centers fall in that time? Right. Yeah, Alec. I think this is right on. <laughs> Jim. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you know, and I'm. Uh, we're available all the time at Let's for Kids, and you know, my email is ally at letsforkids.org, and you know, be in touch anytime. So, letsforkids.org. You can. Thank you for the question. My goodness. Uh, it is a movement. It is you know continual conversation. Our hardest work is ahead. The session is going to be you know all of us really putting our shoulders to it and doing that work together. Um, you can endorse the campaign as an organization. It says, I believe in this effort, 10% of uh, you know, household income is a max affordability, early education comp, and a public investment is, is the key you know, ingredient. Um, as a human, as just a citizen, you can also um, join the campaign. Uh, you know, and both of those things are available on our website. So thank you for the opportunity, and I really appreciate uh, the support in, in continuing that phase of the work. Um, Let's see, how long will this take to phase out? It, I'll just quickly start that and anyone else like to add. I, what we haven't summarized, and I will just, huge shout out to the early childhood champions who, in the room who are legislators. I mean, you are so well served for any Vermonter out there who is watching this by your childcare champs that you've elected. And we have so many in the room today from the speaker, Lieutenant Governor to uh, Representatives Brumstead and Wood, who I see here today, uh, Representative Garifano, and so many more who are here today and beyond, you know, in the House and the Senate and your statewides. Um, these are incredible folks uh, who are, are focused on this and doing the work right now and sharpening their pencils. The five buckets of the bill um, that is sort of being, again, within the legislative process uh, pushed forward by the legislative leaders right now are affordability. You've heard about that. What are the details behind the sliding fee scale, the 10% cap, support for the early childhood educators um, through wages, benefits, and overall support for that workforce, get that pipeline continued. And we haven't talked that much about the pipeline, but you know, I will say there are humans. They're ready to go in the hundreds and hundreds. So this is not a, a pipe. This is not uh, wishful thinking. This is a real. This is a really pipe line, not a pipe dream. Um, so you know, we've got 500 folks in CCV subscribed to the early ed training. You know, um, pathways. We have hundreds of folks coming in from A to B A programs like you've never seen before. So all these things have to meet in the middle. They're not going to stay in Vermont or stay in this field if we don't come through on the wages, you know, sustainably. So these pieces are all being worked on sort of simultaneously. The governance, you know, we absolutely need to have accountable, data-driven, uh, streamlined regulatory system for this, starting with, you know, state government. Um, accessibility, uh, that's that supply and demand, continue to build that infrastructure, bricks and mortar out, although mostly that's the workforce, as you've heard. And then equity, you know, ensuring that there are, every kid in care has the reference services they need, and we've really uh, understood accidental things that we do not want to do, accidental consequences, um, to make sure we do not bake those into the bill so that we're making this inaccessible in some way to historically marginalized populations. So those are the core five buckets of the bill, all being worked on in this session and beyond. 
Um, it will likely, I mean, should we be able to pass this bill this session, right, or even this biennium? It's probably a three to four year phase in, um, which is not unheard of to think about this level of sectoral transformation where you're getting those 8,700 kids access, you know, equitably spread out uh, across the state, um, and that no parent pays more than 10% of their income, and these early educators make a wage, you know, that is in this minimum compensation scale imagined by the workforce. So that's in a nutshell some of the detail behind the bill that we hadn't talked about, the sort of philosophical points that are underlying that work and that phase of about, I would say, you know, three to four years upon passage of this bill, which is why we're so urgent about this work, um, where you might see Vermont be the first place in the country to fully have the all in functional quality system. I'm just curious, is that true? Any big policy work that we do here, we need everyone around the table, and it always takes several years to make sure that we're rolling it out to get it right um, and, and to ensure success. You know, part of Jim's question about getting businesses involved and how do you get involved with the movement, I'm just curious, you know, for Nikki and Adeline, like, is, how do we, how did those conversations start perking up in, or, in your organization? And do you have any advice for businesses out there and how to engage their employees in this really important conversation? Um, you know, sometimes it takes to have a, I don't know, a working parent that is trying to survive at the top and said, okay, <laughs> how do I fix that? Fix that? Um, my leadership team, um, Five out of seven of my leaders are parents with children under the age of 10. So when I brought like, to my team, it's like, hey, we've been donating to Let's Rock Kids. We've been uh, working together for, for years. But I'm like, hey, we need to be champion. Mm -hmm. And we're going to use our business voice mm -hmm. a, 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 a lot more. Are you in? It was like, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, somebody was on Zoom with kids screaming in the back. And just like, what are you asking for? Yes, of course. So for us, it was uh, it was it was a, a no-brainer to a point where you know uh, every year we have uh, an event called Better Make Your Day. We celebrate our employees, and this specific summer, I asked Ali to be our keynote speaker. Uh, to talk about you know uh, the work she's doing and it's like standing ovation from from everybody <laughs> including grandparents that are working in our uh, you know uh, in our company so it's not just the parents that are in the you know uh, daycare stage yeah. it's really across the board and yeah. um, it really has um, yeah it's been a great uh, a great culture a great you know especially People working really hard for the past three years, especially when you're an essential worker. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden you hear pandemic and you have to show up the next day with your fear uh, because you have to make food and you have yeah. no, I mean, you had choices, but if you want to keep working and having salary. So, um, you know, it was just uh, everybody has been rallying around uh, our support of Let's Grow Kids and Vermont Creamery. And every single day since I've been drinking this amazing <laughs> <at> this. tumbler. <laughs> Talk about symbiotic. Right? I love that. I love that. How about you, Nikki? Yeah, I think I would echo a lot of what yeah. you said and also just add that it's really education and awareness. Yeah. Internally in Instramart, we can I use my voice, the president of the company uses his voice, and we just talk to our employees about this issue. I mean, most of them are facing it currently. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we just talk about awareness and, and what are the resources out there for them that they can use now and also get them involved with Let's Grow Kids because there are so many things that from an individual perspective you can do as well and including the action teams in your local county so that piece is really important and then externally it's really just about education for other business leaders like ourselves we a lot of these people are, are our friends we meet with them personally and professionally and it's all about again raising awareness and getting them involved with the issue when we were really facing this we didn't know what the solution was and we were thinking about investing millions of dollars for a child care system within our facility until we met Let's Grow Kids and, and we got engaged with the campaign. So we just really have to get the message out there and get people educated about what it actually is and what it's going to take. Thank you. So helpful. Other questions out here? Representative Campbell? Sure. Uh, so I'm Scott Campbell from St. John's Branch. Uh, we, we decided as a society uh, a long time ago that education was a public good that we ought to, that we ought to pay for. And I guess I'm just, it, it, it strikes me that this ought to be public education. Um, why, should, why should we expect parents to pay 10%? Why should we expect them to pay anything? We, 
we're, we're raising the next generation. This is the most important thing that we as a society do. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering what you what you see the connection that anybody here sees with 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 the public education system with using public schools. We have right now uh, a, a trough in, in the number of kids in, in our schools. So I wonder if anybody can talk about that. Uh, sure, I'm happy to do that. So you know, right now our current setting is. Um, you know, our cur the current structure, right, is that early childhood education is run through, you know, at a thousand separate businesses right now. And, you know, what we're trying to do here is a little bit of the art of the possible, right? We want to, you know, we need a solution now. And so, um, I, I mean, I could not agree with you more that early childhood education should be a public good. It is, um, it is different in terms of the, the, the structure of it when you're dealing with younger children. Um, and so we do really believe that the mixed delivery system that we have right now with people with, that people can choose a, a family child care center, they can choose a, or, um, an early childhood education program that is close to their home or not, or close to their work, right? That they can um, choose um, a public pre-K program, you know, if that works, that some of those, that those choices, especially for families of young children are really important, right? Like you can't put an infant on a bus, right? You can't, um, you know, depending on the, the number of children you have, do you have, is your, you know, is your child, do you have an infant and a toddler, or do you have a preschooler and an elementary school age children? Like, it's just a little bit, it's much more, it's more complicated when you have, um, when you have young children, and so it's not like a one size fits all. So we do feel like some of the flexibility that's associated with the, the mixed delivery system that we have right now is, um, has a lot of benefits for families. Um, and that that's the structure that um, will serve us well in, in making this big change right now, uh, or making the big investment that we need right now. Um, so that's sort of how I think about I, it. I, I, was, I, I wasn't clear, I guess. I, I wasn't suggesting that all the kids go to, yeah. go to school. Uh, just, I was just thinking, that as a, thinking of that as an option. I was thinking really more uh, on, the, on the funding side mm -hmm. that we ought to think of it as I'd be happy to Go. chime in a bit too. You know, it, first of all, we do have to think about it as a public good, and that's what it is, and that's why the public investment and this benefit that again, it's not even just for families with young kids. We all get this benefit so greatly, and nothing magical happens when you're five. There are some differences. Well, first of all, as Janice said, the art of the possible. Look, we don't fund childcare at all as infrastructure as a country. You know, we did it for a minute in World War II. We know exactly how to do it. We showed that. And then, you know, moms came home and said, oh, no, dismantle, right? So, I mean, really, this is the thing that is a little bit um, wild, is that we actually have a blueprint. We've done it before. We know how to do it. And we just haven't acted on it because of the money. So if you say it's just free for all, it's a billion dollar program, right? And we've not even had the courage to fund an affordable program. But the beauty of the affordable is it's not building something that you wouldn't have built otherwise. To Janet's point about best practice and mixed delivery system, there are some key differences about development. There's huge variation in development at this young age. The smaller setting, the close to home, you know, um, just the ratio of staff to students, you know. The other thing is it's voluntary, not compulsory. So it sort of lends itself to a public, private, affordable mixture as opposed to this sort of like one, you know, like block of public ed, you know compulsory at a certain age. So I think this is an evolution in our society. I think this step is a really beautiful step of that evolution. It actually meets the need and it doesn't build an infrastructure that you then want to dismantle and rebuild if you took the full step because that mixed delivery system has been proven to really be best practice to meet the needs of parents, to sort of fit into the cracks, especially in a rural community when actually a home-based provider is a huge piece of that puzzle too. So there are some real elegant reasons why this works and actually is a really important and impactful step. Forward, toward, towards a public good starting at birth. Thank you. So we have time for one more question before we go to closing remarks around the table. Representative Bloomley. Hi, um, I'm Representative Bloomley from uh, Burlington and uh, am married to an early childhood educator um, and have had a lot of discussions because I, I, I toured Pine Forest this fall and, and um, I've had a lot of talks with um, faculty members of different, um, or the, the, the early childhood educators of different um, um, centers. And one of the things that they raised with me is the, um, <clears throat> the concern that 
money will be invested as we as it relates to improving um, the conditions for early childhood ed childhood educators. That there, um, the, the emphasis will be on scholarships <clears throat> um, and um, kind of defraying the cost of education and um, professionalization and not um, on the bottom line in terms of what they actually earn. And there are, there are a lot of places that are hemorrhaging um, staff because people can't make ends meet now and we are losing you know, some experience at each other. So I'm just wondering, can you tell me us more about what is envisioned in terms of addressing you know, the paycheck issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want me just to do a quickie and then? Sure. sure. Basically, I would just say, great question. This is why, back to the message question, we can't nibble around the edges anymore, representatively. We have to do the whole thing, because if you nibble around the edges, you're not funding an infrastructure. And Adeline actually laid it out perfectly. It's a three-legged school stool. I've heard reps you know, talk, and senators talk about this, and that's exactly right. Affordability, access, and quality. They are one thing. You push funding into this field, and it goes to pay the true cost of care. So parents pay no more than they can afford, and the program actually gets the funding to do the true cost of care, which is the majority, the wages for their workforce. So it's one funding mechanism, it's one chunk of change, and it does all the quality access and affordability pieces that is primarily that paycheck. So that is the vision. If you nibble around the edges, it's almost like you're throwing money away at this point because you're not getting all three and you're not building that infrastructure. So I think that's just the mechanism behind what you're asking. Yeah, I think that's right. I think some of the investments we're making right now are, right, just to make it like slightly more palatable, slightly more, you know, like like slightly more um, affordable to be to be an early childhood educator. Um, and you know, in in many states, right, there's been efforts, right, that, like a lot of what the investment is is to make up for the fact that we don't have a well compensated workforce, right? And we try all, you know, different places, you try all these pilots to improve quality, pay for coaches, pay for all this sort of stuff. And instead you get, um, and it's like, well, the, how about we try, we pilot actually paying people <laughs> what they, you know, what a fair wage is for this work. And you, there are states that are doing this already. And the improvement in terms of the um, retention of staff you know, especially important for these little children, right, who are like having, you know, interactions with their, these, you know, close interactions with their caregivers. Um, you know, it's, it's absolutely dramatic. Um, so absolutely, we have the mechanism to make sure that that investment goes to compensation for early childhood educators is critically important. Um, and then, you know, then there do need to be sort of the wraparound resources and supports for, um, program leaders and, um, mentors and all that sort of stuff. But yes, that is, um, that will only be effective if we get the compensation um, to early childhood educators who deserve it. Great. Thank you for the fantastic questions, everyone. And at this time, I'd like to uh, wrap up with any closing remarks or thoughts from the panelists. Uh, Adeline, do you want to start? Um, I would say that, um, you know, I think we, we all heard that it's just, it's a win, 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 win. Um, for, for, for not only today, for, but we're talking generation of in, impacted. So it's just, you know, the fact that you have, uh, you know, parents that used to come to your daycare. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a very long term uh, opportunity for us. The other thing I would call out is we have less school kids. Um, I remember when I first joined, um, you know, we were like, okay, you want us to invest? Like, what's the plan? What's the program? Are you solid with this thing? Or is it just a big ambitious goal? And um, we're very lucky to have an organization that's been at it for years, decade, mm -hmm. that has a very solid plan on how we can fix that, that we can trust, that we believe we can invest in. And so, um, and we won't have that score case forever. So not only the environment is ready for it, but we also get to seize the moment why we have an organization that's so powerful that is so uh, educated around the plan that is going to work. And I just uh, want to call that out. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Chris? Um, I think uh, the public already invests in its citizens. Unfortunately, a lot of the investment that this plan would fix is right now being put on the correction. We just need to shift our thought and make a stronger foundation, and then we won't be putting all the money into correction. 
and, and losing all that time. Every time we go through a lifespan, you're losing a generation. You know, and, and we've known for a long time how to fix it. We don't have another 10 years, another generation to lose because we can't implement it. We need to, we need to act now. Thank you, Chris. How about you, Janet? And I would just add, I think that uh, early childhood educators, you know, are very, um, uh, like they are, they are working, they're working their tails off right now. They are, you know, having their moments of feeling um, overwhelmed, but also are seeing that there is a potential for a solution in a way that they've never experienced in their lifetime. And um, I'm so um, hopeful that we can do that. But I just would flag that, that, you know, the reason that, you know, we're talking about early childhood educators and compensation, things like that. But the whole reason that matters is because we were talking about, like, our, our babies, right? Our infants, our toddlers, our preschoolers. These are some of the, you know, the young, they are the youngest and they're some of the most vulnerable citizens in our state. Um, and their well-being um, and their healthy development is what motivates early childhood educators every day. And we just need to make that it possible for every child to have that place like Chris was talking about. Thank you. Thank you. I really just want to thank you all for the time and this platform today. It's, it's really compelling to be able to share stories and, and see you guys engaged in the conversation. Um, my encouragement and closing remarks would just be a, a moment to get involved. So let's figure this out together. The time is now. We have Let's Grow Kids. We have a plan. We have action. So ask questions and get involved. I'd hate to see this become continually a transient issue where everybody just grows out of this because then their kids are five and they're in public education. I don't want to see that. I want to see real systemic change. I want to see Vermont take action for this and be a leader in the nation in this. And so um, really just get involved and ask questions and let's figure out how to do it together. Great, thank you. Allie. Just thank you to every single one of you. I think we're about to show we still can come together and solve big problems. So. Here we go. <laughs> Great. I love this momentum. Everyone, please join me in thanking this wonderful team. So inspiring. Now I'd love to turn it back over to Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray. Hey. Uh, well, I have some unfortunate news. This is the conclusion of our first, I think, is this the first ever legislative summit on child care and paid leave? Um, I want to again give a huge round of applause to Jill and the child care panel. Uh, I think this was super, super inspiring. So. <laughs> <laughs> and to thank all of the leaders in the room, the legislators, uh, newly elected as well, and for joining us both in person um, and online. I also want to recognize Conor Kennedy, uh, Jill's chief of staff, for helping to organize my chief of staff, Andrew Gillespie. Uh, this has been a project that's been in the works for the last couple of months. Um, and I guess just to reflect on some of the things that we've heard just over the last three hours, and I just wrote down a couple of themes. This regular theme around a public good, that we know that paid family and medical leave can't be voluntary, that we know that child care can't be voluntary, that we can't put it on businesses to figure it out on their own that we know that paid family and medical leave is really good for retaining workers. We know it's essential, childcare is essential for retaining and recruiting workers. And that workers need paid leave, including our incredible childcare workers. Um, that we have to keep up the pressure and the momentum and that we have a lot of lessons learned from the pandemic and we can't let those slip by because we're not out of the pandemic, um, but certainly the needs continue. We know that it's not happening in Washington, it's happening right here in Vermont. Um, and I think to, to quote this panel, the time is now, the time is now on, on both, and it's time to raise the quality of life for every Vermonter to quote Ali. So um, thank you all for coming. The recording will be available. Um, I wanna thank Orca for offering to record the Legislative Summit. So we'll get that out to all of you. Please share it with colleagues who aren't here. We need more champions. And I just wanna thank you all again and, and hand the floor back to Jill for some closing thoughts. Thank you so much. Uh, so, wow, right? Wow. <laughs> I just want to thank all of you for joining us today and your commitment and advocacy uh, for these clearly important policies that we need to take on. The data and the information we heard today clearly highlights the need for a universal paid family medical 
Family Leave Program for all Vermonters and high quality, affordable child care. We know Vermonters are struggling and it is imperative that we pass legislation that allows us to take care of our family, our kids, and our communities. We need policies that are flexible and that meets the needs of Vermonters from all walks of life. So we all heard the strong arguments today about why this is so important and why we need to take this on and I'm fired up to do this work. And I just want to take a moment again, we, this isn't possible without our early childhood educators. It's just not possible. And like I said, they, they were superheroes during this pandemic. And I've told this story before, um, and I have to repeat it. You know, my close friend has a little one at Robin's Nest. And I can't tell you, the, the best moment of our day was when we got the little note home about what he did and what he accomplished that day. And that kept us going. That little note meant the world to our families and other families. And it was the commitment to be there um, during this incredible tough time. And it's now our job to be there for them and to make sure um, that we're taking care of all of our families. And so we have some big goals ahead of us. But I am fired up, and I know that we can do it together. So thank you, Molly, for your leadership in this work. We will miss you. Thank you so much. Again, thank you to uh, all of our incredible panelists today. Uh, this is not the end of the conversation. This is a continuation, and we need all of your voices at the State House in Montpelier. So thank you again for being here, and now let's get to work. <laughs> Good job. Thank you so much.